Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 531, featuring an interview with Stephen Frost and Ian Sherman of Digital Eclipse. Now this is one hell of a studio. Uh, they're doing what I call the Lord's work. And not just preserving uh, classic games, making them playable on modern systems, but bringing a lot of context, the developer story, the behind-the-scenes stuff. They, uh, they're basically the Criterion, uh, Criterion Collection. Uh, of video games. I mean, it's just absolutely incredible. Their Gold Master series. They got one uh, with Jordan Mechner called The Making of Karataka. They got one with uh, uh, Jeff Minter uh, of Llamasoft. Of course, they got the Atari 50. Uh, just really fantastic stuff. But uh, in this series, we'll talk mostly about their Wizardry 1 remaster, which is, of course, great. <laughs> but uh, we'll get into that other stuff, too. We talk about preservation, uh, controls, future-proofing, ports versus remakes versus remastering. And, of course, their Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Rita's Rewind game coming up very, very soon. Uh, anyway, we've got a lot to cover here. So without further ado, here is Ian and Stephen. So, Stephen, Ian, yeah. Digital Eclipse, good stuff. Been having a great time with the uh, Wizardry uh, remake. But, you know, I was just telling uh, uh, Ian before you jumped on, Stephen, I've kind of gotten sucked into that <laughs> whole Wizardry thing again. <laughs> You know, it is amazingly addictive, and I mean, that remake just, yeah, I kind of see it as, you get the nostalgia of the original game, but I think the, all the quality of life improvements, you know, it, it gets you past all that stuff, of, it kind of annoys you when you go back to a really old game. Yeah, it's tough, it's yeah. tough because sometimes as we, you know, Ian can test too, there's like, in your brain, when you remember some of these games originally, how you perceive it or remember it in your brain is not necessarily exactly what the game was yeah. um, so when we add the quality of life improvements or or any sort of improvements generally it's to sort of try to deliver on what people's memory is of the game versus what it actually was right um because oftentimes if you deliver exactly what the game is um then people are like oh maybe this is this isn't as good as i remember it or, or things like that right so we still want to hit those nostalgia nostalgia strings but you definitely have to try to apply some quality of life improvements in order to you know hit the expectation mark. And we tried to walk that line really carefully. Um, one of the things we committed to very early in the development of the Wizardry remake was we wanted to make sure if we departed in some way from the original design, um, we tied that to an option so that the user could turn it off and have exactly the original experience we want. Now we didn't do that like a hundred percent of the time, but we did it for nearly everything we we changed about the game, um, for good or for ill. So <laughs> I think you did a great job. I mean, I love the little Apple II uh, window <laughs> on the screen, so you could just look down and see what it looked like back in the day, you know. And <laughs> uh, the funny story about that is that was mostly we we created that initially sort of as a debugging feature. Like our approach to developing the game was we had the access to the original Pascal source code. We ported that to C++. Um, what we did over top of the C++ is we integrated that with Unreal Engine and added a lot of modern graphics and presentation and UI and stuff. Um, but the first thing we got working was that very simple Pascal port to C++ and we had the textual rendering and it's still controlled with the keyboard and all of that stuff. But every, like, as we started adding the graphics, you know, we were demoing it to people, people who were, you know, vested partners in this project. And everybody said, like, that's really cool. You should keep that in yeah. the game. And we're like, oh, well, there's no, you know, we can, there's no reason not to. So we did. <laughs> you should definitely thank those people. That was a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot it was in Pascal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's My Pascal a... was very rusty. I had to refresh a lot to Jeez. make this work. I don't know any pascal uh, well you guys you've been in the uh industry for quite a while you know i was looking at your uh linkedin page uh steven yes i saw yeah. man up here so after but yeah 20 plus years and roll sega activision electronic arts i mean i'm kind of like is there any place you didn't work <laughs> uh yeah it's like you know i kind of moved around to to sort of different companies to kind of get exposure i think I think I wanted, you know, as I was progressing along, uh, I've always had an interest in like understanding of a, a large variety of game genres and types. And I think I also just subconsciously wanted to be aware of how different companies kind of worked as well and what worked well and what worked, you know, not so great. Um, and so I kind of, you know, went from company to company for a while, kind of experiencing that. And then 
things kind of clicked for me when I when I uh, hit at Sega because it hit kind of the nostalgia strings of me growing up, right, uh, playing Sega games, and then being able to work on those properties that I remember as a child um, really like clicked with me, and so I was really happy sort of working there and ended up you know almost working there for a, a decade. Um, but I think the good thing about uh, working at the bigger companies is that, um, you know, there's a certain way of doing stuff. Things can move a little bit more slower. Decisions can be a little slower. And so when I came back and, and, you know, part of ways the sort of Sega, when they moved down to Southern California, um, I wanted to look for a smaller company, right? I wanted a little bit more of an intimate experience where I could know everybody. I'm not just like a number, right? <laughs> Employee number, like 1,200, um, and have a chance to sort of influence the products that I was working on. And, you know, I wanted another place that kind of tugged at my nostalgia strings, right? And DE, Digital Clips, have, you know, working with a lot of emulation stuff, older properties and things like that, things that I grew up with, again, really resonated. And so kind of like the size, the people and sort of the properties uh, that we are working on really kind of resonated for me and, and made me fall in love with sort of working here. Ian, you want to? Oh, well, yeah. Like, I mean, th one of the things that Digital Eclipse brings to the table, I feel, is we do have a lot of experience on, on our belt because, I, you know, I've been in the industry also 20 years, not not quite as long as Stephen or a couple of the other folks here. But um, but most of the, differently, most of my experience has been with this crew of people. Um, the Digital Eclipse brand goes back to the 90s, uh, but more importantly, the, the people involved uh, sort of all work together at companies that weren't called digital clips. Like for example, a lot of us worked at backbone together um, where then we became other ocean and then eventually digital clips again. And all of those, like all these companies are different names, but you know, it's like 60, 70, 80% the same people. So it was a group of people. We like working together. We work well together. We get a lot done together. Um, props to our studio head, Mike Micah, is that the right title for him, Stephen? Mike Micah is yes. studio head? Uh, yes. Um, because, I thought say, is that his right name? <laughs> like, yeah, is, he, is he called Mike? Yeah, no, I know his <laughs> no, name. No, no, that is, uh, yeah. <laughs> but just it's like, he sort of, I love working with him and he he brings us all together. And the reason being is just like, interesting stuff just happens around him. Like I've gotten to work on the coolest stuff working with Mike, you know, the wizardry is just the latest in a, in a string. But again, like Steven, like nostalgic stuff. I mean, like I got to work on Mega Man. I've done a, a Minecraft game. I've worked in rock band. I've done all kinds of crazy different things. So it's good to good to be part of this crew. <laughs> I'm like a really great crew. I mean, just looking at the games and the stuff like making of Karataka and the Atari. Uh, forget the what's the name of your atari uh <laughs> atari 50 atari 50 the atari 50 thing you yeah, know yeah. I was playing around with that everybody gets the name wrong steve drives like Stephen crazy <laughs> game company that i wanted i would ever want to work for it'd be this one because i mean you're doing exactly the kind of stuff i you know i write books do youtube videos and stuff but you know if, if i could do what you're doing i'd do it that way it makes a lot of sense yeah, I think the great thing and this is a this is a silly kind of thing and because it seems obvious but it, what we're able to do generally is kind of match people with projects that they're personally interested in, right? And it's a, it's a huge difference, you know. Um, I see a lot of times, having worked at some of the bigger companies, you get assigned products that you don't really have an interest in, or it's like a genre that you don't really care about, and you kind of do your job and stuff like that. But because we are sort of a smaller studio, and we kind of get to choose the things that we get to work on... Um, we're more easily able to pursue things that we are personally interested in, whether we grew up with it or just, you know, over the years have, have gotten an interest in it. Um, but because of that, um, and you have an, uh, you know, you're working on something that you really love or really appreciate or enjoy, you tend to organically put forth more energy into it, right? You really invested into it. And I think that's how we're able to create sort of the quality of products that we generally do with relatively small teams, because we continue to try to only work on stuff that we're passionate about or care about, right? Intrinsically. And I think that's a huge, it's a huge uh, component of, of the studio. We want to make sure we, we pursue, you know, pursue that and continue doing that in the years ahead as well. I think that comes through really well, you know, in all the products that, you know, played around. So you guys, 
I was looking through your uh, the games you have on Steam. Mm -hmm. You're doing sort of like retro platformer type stuff, and there's a lot of sort of arcade like games. Before you got into like the making of series and these. Yeah, we've always had our feet in of, sort of that that like kind era. of over yeah, the exactly, exactly. And we still do a variety of stuff, you know. Just you know, if you think about wizardry as sort of this kind of uh, uh, modernization modernization of of wizardry, right? And and what we can do to sort of not only um, increase the audience uh, interest in it, but also add the quality of life improvements and things like that. And we kind of pursue that across the variety of things, right? You know, we'll do our classic sort of emulation based collections. We will do kind of original games like the recently announced, you know, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Rita's Rewind, mm -hmm. which is a brawler at its heart, but again, harkens back to the nineties, right? The heyday of that classic era of gaming, Everyone was experimenting with stuff. Arcades were still alive and, and you'd visit them. And so the, our nostalgia and sort of our goal um, is to sort of deliver upon that 80s, 90s classic experience in everything that we do, right? Whether it's putting a fresh coat on, of paint on that experience like Ian did with Wizardry, creating a new experience that captures that gameplay and kind of look and feel of that kind of um, style of game that was popular back then, or you know, emulating, creating these sort of releases, these uh, collections that emulate the classic IPs and games. So I think everything that we do, while it will, you know, kind of spread across different genres and different types of uh, projects, we always go back to that that classic era and nostalgic feeling that we want to capture for people. And I'll, I'll follow up on something Stephen said there, which is like, because we've been mostly in the industry a while and, and all of us have been gamers for even longer, like we bring a lot of experience about, you know, what would be considered by modern standards retro games, but you there are a lot of lessons that you can learn by understanding that you know the whole scope of of the history of game development in the design space, like what works, what doesn't work. That a lot of people who jump in now who don't have that kind of experience, they'll fall into some traps that maybe like, oh no, we know this doesn't work because we we've seen examples of it not working well, or we know this does work really well, and we're going to pursue these kind of goals. So we have we have that under our belts as well. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's a really it's a good point because uh, you know just building upon that, it's like. We play, we live our lives and, and, and we sort of play these classic games, but also, especially in recent years with like, you know, Atari 50 and the Jeff Minter and the making of Karateka, we start to do deep dives in and, and engage with the people who made these games, right? And understand why they made these games, you know, what were the design philosophies behind it? And you learn a lot by doing that investigation and that those interactions with people. And I think from a game making side, you know, I could probably speak for Ian and everyone else here as we as we dive deeper and we sort of explore these older games with the people who made them. And not only is our appreciation for games, you know, sort of elevated, but our understanding of what makes good games, you know, and the, the sort of gameplay types that resonate with people. Um, we learn a lot from that, uh, that you may not otherwise. Yeah, I was. Well, there's so much to talk about here. My, <laughs> my brain's exploding. But I, I really just love this the, the making of Karataka, the way that you did that. I mean, I, I I didn't know quite what to expect. You know, I figured, well, there's some interviews, there's some there's some cool footage, some goodies and stuff. I was I had no idea. <laughs> like, like this is glorious. I mean, you've got uh like the rotoscoping stage yeah. where you can see like every step of the process and like what what didn't happen, what what could have happened. And <laughs> I mean, you you bring it to life. Yeah, I think it's what 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 well, helps. I write books about this stuff. <laughs> it's impossible yeah. to, to get some of this across in a book format when you can do what you do and say, "Well, here, play the play the prototype." Yeah, that's exactly actually what you just stated is actually the thing, the epiphany we had. It's like, you know, you have video game documentaries as non-interactive stuff, but the best medium to kind of talk about games and showcase games are in games themselves, right? So that you can play them you can you can understand what uh what the creation process is and and i think that was sort of the impetus for the creation of the the gold master series in general was a um to sort of spotlight on games or you know video game developers who we love and cherish and who we feel made a huge impact on the industry from an early 
early age, right? And and brought us to where we are today. Uh, putting a spotlight on those on those folks, but also being able to kind of provide the human story behind it. I, I think what really resonated about the making of Karateka, obviously we include the games and the behind the scenes and all that stuff, but really what it is, it's a very much relatable human story, right? It's about Jeff uh, Jordan Mechner and his desire to make games and it's his journey you know through multiple failures to get to that point and i think that's a story that people can relate to right there are many people out there who play video games who always dreamed of wanting to create video games or something along those lines now here's this this kid who wanted to drop out of college basically right didn't want to go to school he wanted to make games and he had this wonderful relationship with his father, who, while didn't he didn't understand it initially, supported it, you know, supported him in in sort of pursuing this endeavor of making games. And so it's it's sort of this interesting dynamic between the two as they're as they're getting older, and you kind of see like the the journey from when uh, Jordan was younger to where he is now. But more importantly, you see his journey through failures and overcoming them adversity, right? So you see how he created a prototype and he sends it out and he gets feedback and then he fixes that stuff. And then he creates another prototype and you keep progressing on until the final product. And you see his evolution as a game maker. You see the triumph of right overcoming failures and succeeding and creating something that is well loved in the end. And so at his heart, it's a story that uh, people can, I think, relate to. And I think that's why it resonates with everyone. It's not just a documentary. It's something that people can understand and people dream of themselves and, and they can association with. And I think we found out um, that that was the case really when we started getting a lot of emails and people reaching out saying like, hey, I don't know what the making of Karateka is really. I didn't grow up with that. I'm too young. But I understand this story and I understand the journey that he made and I really can appreciate and enjoy that. And, and so they they start to kind of get more invested and involved and stuff like that. And that's what we want to do. We want to bring the human side to game development, right? It's not just a giant corporation or an army of people. Um, it's regular folks like Ian and myself <laughs> and trying to create something that... Um, puts a smile on people's faces, right? Um, Hopefully and that in was 10 wonderful. or 20 years, they'll do this about <laughs> yeah, us. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, when we do the Digital Eclipse, Digital Eclipse collection, yeah, uh, that exactly. will happen. Um, but really, that's what it is. It's a human story, and we want to try to continue that with the Gold Master series, and I think that's why it's resonated with people, really. It's beautiful. I mean, the, I didn't even know any of that stuff about like his dad being a composer and composing the music. Like, you've got the way it's set up. You sort of hear him play the piano and you're like, oh, that's cool. Then you hear like what it sounded like in the game. And yeah. it just totally changes your you know, appreciation for what, what they did there. We were very lucky uh, working with Jordan just by virtue of the nature of his personality is that I, I don't know if he knew what he was doing at the time was like important or historic, but he, he meticulously kept documentations and notes yes. and stuff that we were able to take advantage of. And that's sadly not the case for a lot of these projects that are beloved. So, uh, but our goal, you know, as preservationists and historians is like, we, we want to dig that stuff up and we want to present it to, to our players uh, to the best that we can. So. Yeah, I think all three of these things uh, that we're talking about here should be, <laughs> they probably already are, but you know, any kind of game studies program, game studies class, if they're not using these <laughs> uh, with their students, what the hell are they doing? I mean, this is like- We're starting to get there. We're starting to get there. We actually had some people reach out recently um, for the Making of Karateka and, and trying to integrate some of it into uh, class studies and things like that. So it's starting to get traction and stuff like that. And I can imagine, hopefully my dream, you know, in the years ahead is that, you know, some of the stuff does become part of, you know, classes and, and teaching about the history of video games uh, and, and things like that, um, especially as we start, as you are well aware, we lose a lot of stuff like every year, like we lose a lot of history in the video game uh, industry. And um, we try to do our small part in preserving as much as we can. Um, but it's important that, you know, kids and, and people who are, are growing up in today's society uh, remember and learn from uh, the rich history that we've had in the past. So, um, you know, hopefully we can do something and, and sort of 
participate in and help teachers who are interested to uh, facilitate, you know, the education uh, of some of this older video game history to uh, to kids and and people growing up today. That would be well knowing how I, I don't know. I got kind of the insider view of academics, so it wouldn't surprise <laughs> me if they're slow to, to yeah. latch on to this. But you're like, come on, yeah. <laughs> that you know, the Atari thing is just a no brainer for any class. I mean, if it's got any kind of history component uh, to a game studies class, I mean, obviously. Oh, you would want that. But anyway, just in more general speak, if we can kind of broaden this a little bit, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of uh, developers over the years. And one of the themes that I've come across multiple times, even a uh, Brian Fargo, you know, airplay people like that. And they'll, uh, they'll talk about how the younger generations have no inkling of any of the stuff they've done. You know, he, his example was, oh, yeah, I made Bardstell and Wasteland. What? <laughs> what are those you know and there's no concept it's like this kind of disposable you make a game it's forgotten mm. a lot of people are shocked that you know i'm even you know i talked to the, the same thing with the fantasy series the developer of that he was like wow i just can't believe anybody's still interested you right. know in this so i think the work that you guys are doing i think it's important for classes and, and students but i think it's got ramifications for the industry uh, as a whole right to try to get people to Quit seeing basically changing the way people see games. Yeah, I think that is that sounds uh, grandiose, but <laughs> no, no, it's a very it's a very valid point. And I think um it's aspirational. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think the way you do that, and I think Atari 50 is a, is an example of this, is that um early on the industry was content to throw a variety of retro games into a collection with some, you know, artwork or box covers and call it a day. Um and the problem with that is it appeals to people who know the games and have a sense of nostalgia for those games, but it doesn't expand the audience at all because um, it doesn't teach you anything, right? Um, what we tried to do with Atari 50 is um, explain to people why each of the games included in the collection were important, right? It's a curated list. And while there's over 100 of them, there's a reason why all 100 plus of them are in this release. Um, and we... As you go through the timelines, you start to understand why these games were important, what impact they had to the industry, and why the people who created them are so revered. And I think when you provide that context, the context is very important, right? That's the thing that people are starting to learn about now across the industry, that games by themselves and just uh, you know behind-the-scenes content by itself is not going to do anything. You have to explain to people why they should really care about a product. Um, and when you do that, like I said earlier, they start to get invested. And there were so many people with Atari 50 because it was kind of the first time that there was a deep dive into the history of Atari and, and sort of an explanation of its significance and what it did for the video game industry and, and all these games and genres that it kind of helped start, right? Once you explain that to people, uh, even people who are you know teenagers now or in their 20s, um, they, you know, they reach out to us and they say like, hey, you know, I didn't grow up in Atari. I'm only familiar with the Fuji symbol because I had a t-shirt from the mall, right? <laughs> um, but because you kind of articulated it, why um, these games are important and you explain it to me, I have a, a newfound appreciation for it. So we had a lot of people who were not really aware of Atari, you know, outside of a narrow, very narrow sort of awareness, who are now part of the Atari family, right? They've come into it now because... They understand where this company came from and they're excited about where it's going. And I think that's an important part of the things that like Ian works on with Sword of Wizardry and us. And it's kind of like, it's like, what can we do to explain to people, especially the younger generations, why you should care about these people, why you should care about these games? It's not enough just to put them out there. You have to kind of provide the reasoning. And that's really what we focus on uh, in all of our sort of releases nowadays is just that explanation of like, hey, over here, like, you know, look at this game. You should care about it. And here, here's, here's why. And I think people appreciate that. Yeah, I certainly appreciate it. Even like, I would say you're almost gamifying. I don't like that word necessarily, but you're kind of gamifying game history. Yeah, yeah, way. for sure. I, I, got in, I remember when I, was, when I was doing the Atari when I got an achievement. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. You know, wow. Did it, you know, now I'm like seeing, okay, it says I got like 5% explored. 
<laughs> like, oh, I can't have 5%. Come on. You know, I thought I got through everything. And I'm going to go back, you know, try to figure out what I, what I'm missing. And it's almost like a game like element to the, uh, to the, not just the games themselves, but the whole experience is kind of a game. Yeah. We want it to be, we want it to be fun. And we also want it to be like very friendly to jump in. You know, I kind of equate it to, um, a museum piece where you go into a museum exhibit and there's a bunch of like different areas. Like let's say you're doing dinosaurs and there's like, you know, some dinosaur imagery, imagery over here. There's some text over here. There's a video playing over here, right? There's interactive dinosaur kiosk over here. And, and as a person wanting to learn about dinosaurs, you can go to any of those sort of displays and choose the way that you get absorbed that information in any order. And I think that's the key thing that we wanted for um, the Gold Master Series and Atari 50 and, and future stuff is that there's no one right way to kind of digest this stuff, right? You can jump around, you can watch all the videos, you can look at the artwork, you can just play the games, um, but everything's really quick. Everything's very snappy. You can jump around between the games, play it for a few seconds, jump back and read about it. And I think, again, harking back to sort of today's um, sort of climate and the attention, you know, the shortness of attention spans, um, you have to kind of build things that way so that people can digest them very easily and very quickly. And then like you were saying, gamifying it to like, say like, hey, I just finished a hundred percent of this timeline, right? That's kind of an exciting thing to accomplish. And um, it may be a subtle thing, but it also just makes the whole process of like learning about these things a little bit more fun and, and enjoyable, right? You know, are you familiar with understanding comics by... Scott McCloud, have you seen that? That was yes. required reading in my yeah. college. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta see what you're doing. Sort of like what he does in that <laughs> that book in a lot of ways. You know, it's like here, let me use we're gonna tell you about this game design mechanic or game concept, but I'm not just gonna tell you about it, right? You I want to be working in the medium itself yep. so I can let you experience this. And I always just thought that was brilliant. <laughs> you know, there's a reason I think I don't think Scott McCloud's book would be as successful if it was just a regular book, you know. It needed to be a, uh, a comic. I'm going right. to steal that analogy. I like that. Uh -huh. I'm going to bring that up in the future. <laughs> okay. So we, we talked, I guess, a little bit about remakes and some of the differences between a remake and a port or whatever language you want to use for that. And you, you kind of ex been explaining what your mission is and how you don't just want to do straight. What's the word? Is it port? Is, it, is that the right word? <laughs> you know, you well, don't want to... Just yeah, I guess there's always there yeah, there. there's there's just, always a question mark about like remaster, remakes, remaster, and stuff like that. And the, maybe you just start there. What are the different terms? Well, I guess <laughs> it's tough. Like I, I don't know where Ian quantifies is like I always kind of, you know, um I always it's it depends on how people approach it. And I think every company you go to has a, a sort of a different um understanding or concept of it, right? And um, I don't know, Ian, do you have any like personal well, sort of it, it's fuzzy and I wish it were less fuzzy um, because you, you have to both operate in, in the terminology space at a place where everybody who's doing the development can understand it, but also your audience can understand it, too. So if you're talking about something like wizardry, like if we say that's a remaster, people sort of grok what we are doing with it right away. But I often argue, at least privately, that Wizardry is actually kind of more of a, a port uh, because it is actually running the original code underneath. Like we, we did modify it slightly, but it is, it is a very accurate representation of the original game. And like some of the facets that go into picking the right term also have to do with the development process, which the, the players aren't necessarily aware of. So like I say a port and that might not mean something to somebody, which is why we tend to say something like remaster. I wouldn't say it's a remake. The difference there being um, we didn't like make a work alike or make a game inspired by or very close to the original game. It is the original game. So there's some hard distinctions you can make there. But again, like, like what we do is a spectrum and yeah, I would say there's maybe five or six kind of approaches we take and we could call each of them a different name, but also doing that kind of muddies the water a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I think I think oftentimes the public reviews the remaster is like, oh, you're going to have improved visuals and audio and stuff like that. Um, we kind of consider those as quality of life improvements, but, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's 
it's one of those things where like you can consider a, a remaster is like, yeah, it's basically the original game. There might be some enhancements here and there. Uh, a remake is sort of like inspired by the original game, right? But you're kind of recreating it uh, with a sort of modern aesthetic with modern sensibilities and stuff like that. And it can end up a, a fairly bit different than the original game, right? And then a port theoretically, and, and Ian kind of alludes loses too it's like normally a port case is like people view that like okay you're just taking the original game you're bringing it to a new platform but fundamentally the game is unchanged right to a degree and wizardry is kind of like this weird hybrid because it is <laughs> fundamentally unchanged because it runs on the core experience but we've also done a bit of this remaster treatment with the improved visuals new music quality of life improvements and stuff like that so it's kind of a little bit of a hybrid i would say yeah, but man, does it still have that same tension? <laughs> <laughs> well, you were we were chatting before we started the podcast, and you were saying how you you kind of got hooked back into playing it. Yeah. And one of the things I will say, you know, to its credit, like when I started working on this project, I hadn't played it. I had probably played it maybe a decade ago, but not in a you know not recently for sure. And I started playing again, and I also got sucked right back in. And a little dirty secret that a lot of devs won't tell you is oftentimes by the time we shipped a product, we're really tired of it and we don't want to have anything to do with it anymore. But that was not the case with me for Wizardry. Like I have played it multiple times during the life cycle of Wizardry. I've played it since it was released. And it just, it goes to show that um, the original developers, you know, uh, they, they, sort of tapped into something like the, the core loop is just really satisfying in a way where it's very clear why it inspired, you know, a lot of subsequent RPGs, pretty much the entire JRPG genre, you know, your Dragon Quest, your Final Fantasies, even things like Pokemon and Dark Souls, all of the creators of these have said, yeah, like we are directly inspired by wizardry. And I think it's because it's like, yeah, I'm playing this game from, you know, 1981 and it's clunky, but I'm still having a good time with it. So there's something there. <laughs> I think it's all about that. You're safe in the town. <laughs> and then you got to go down and then you're going deeper and deeper. And the whole time you're thinking, I, I got to get back up the town. You know, I can't go too deep. You know, so there's a nice, uh, you always feel like, oh. So it's nice. a risk reward, right? Risk reward. Yes. Is that risk reward? Uh, I thought I had another thought. Oh, I, I was thinking about the remaster, not to go back. <laughs> we can circle back to that for a minute. It's your podcast. <laughs> Compare that to say uh, movies and, and out, uh, famous albums. And a lot of times I'll hear, oh, they're, this is a remastered version of a Black Sabbath album. Right. You know, and pretty much, I don't even have to look at the comments. You know, there's, there's going to be complaints. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the bass is too loud. You know, this is not, this, you know, there's always, it's always a kind of a mixed bag, I guess. You know, do you think it's similar to that, or is this a completely different sort of? Are product? you asking if we get complaints? Because yes, <laughs> uh, no. Uh, so, so, like, you know, remaking or remastering <laughs> or whatever you want to call it, a movie or a. a some of our goals. So we we have two goals, right? Like, so some of our goal is to preserve, like, we try to identify um, the original author's intent, um, and we try to be extremely faithful to that, and that's like our high level goal. But of course, we're going to inject some of our personality into it that's unavoidable, where people and we're making things we're passionate about. So there's kind of a balancing act there. And some people love what we do, and some people are not going to love what we do. But you know, we, we're going to keep trying to do it to the best of our ability. I, I coined a term, I'll let Stephen comment on this in a moment, I'm sure he has something to say, but I coined a term uh, because I've been doing this sort of approach like we did with Wizardry for a couple of games now, and I call it code forensics. Um, and it may have been predated me, but I like to say I can look at the source code for something and I get to see a, a viewpoint, an angle on these products that almost nobody else in the world has. And I see like, oh, I can tell just by the structure of the code, like this is what they were thinking. This was the, what they were trying to go for. I also get to see cool things like, oh, here's like a half implemented feature that they didn't finish. And sometimes we say, should we finish it or should we make something like it so that we can present that to the modern audiences? And that's a lot of fun. That's maybe the favorite, my favorite part of my job. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a valid point. The 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 creator's intent or the original intent is is kind of a key mantra like that we try to follow here. And it, it can... It, express itself in a variety of ways, right? Um, uh, we talk to the original folks when we can, um, and we talk to, and one 
you know, one example of this, that's a, a case of original intent, which I'd love to bring up is um, we did uh, some years back, we released a, a Disney collection that had Aladdin and the Lion King in it. And um, there's a version of Aladdin in there called the final cut version. And what it was is that while we were interviewing the original team members or a lot of the team members who worked on Aladdin, they all had the sort of like, oh, I wish we could have done this or I wish this would have been fixed. And, you know, back then, you know, there were tight deadlines. You had to go cart manufacturing. There was no patch system for anything, right? Mm. And so they didn't have time to deliver on what their actual goals were for Aladdin, really, fundamentally. Um, there were several things that if they had a, another month or so, they would sort of address. And so I was sitting there watching these interviews and I was like, hey, uh, we can deliver on these, like we can actually do this. And so we kind of went in and we made what is the final version of Aladdin technically. And it basically fixes all of the things that they would have fixed, their intention to fix, um, and created a version of Aladdin that would have been the one that they would have wanted to release, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's sort of important. Um, it, it comes across in, in those sort of ways or like hardware limitations, right? Like sometimes um, you don't want to mess with performance because a game is built upon it, right? Um, and other times uh, performance of the hardware that a game runs on uh, hampered the experience, right? And we, in those cases, we may want to adjust it so that the performance is improved so that the actual experience is what the developer intended, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think in most cases, when we can, we want to make sure that we deliver on what the goals and intentions from the developer were, right? Um, and if you were to remove hardware limitations or any other limitations, what was that goal that they tried to achieve? So I think that drives, just like Ian was saying, that drives us a lot and helps us make decisions about things uh, as best we can. And I think if we hold true to that, you know, good or bad, we can at least say that we are faithful to the original kind of experience. And that's what we want to do. Um, so yes, you know, there are always going to be complaints and, 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 you know, uh, about anything sort of that touches things that people are passionate about, but you kind of have to look at it across the majority, right? There, there are going to be outlier cases for sure, but have you hit the mark where a vast majority of people who played this game or who are enjoyed in the past are happy with it now? And if they are, then you've kind of also accomplished your goal. And that's all you can really do uh, to a degree, right? You can't please everyone all of the time. And um, to, do, to try and do so would just make you crazy. And <laughs> so we can't, we can't do that. Yeah, it's an interesting situation, I guess. I, 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 I was playing uh, Task Times in Tone Town. We had Becky Berger, who programmed it you know on, on the video and i think you can make a drinking game out of how many times she said well we would have done it this way but <laughs> you know, we didn't have the memory or the you know this and that limitation so yeah i would wonder if somebody if you were remaking something like that how many of those would you say oh okay well we can now <laughs> it's trivial now <laughs> uh, yeah but and that's always a tough decision like for the same game i mean yeah. how do you you know decide yeah and and part of it is also stepping back from a consumer perspective. And I think working on things that we grew up with or are aware of um, and have strong ties to helps out a lot, right? It's a lot more challenging if we were to work on a property that we didn't already have some sort of understanding or investment in, right? It becomes a little bit tougher to make those decisions. Um, but fortunately um, for the products that we work on, there's always people on the team who have some sort of intimate or passionate knowledge about the properties. And that helps to drive, also drive decisions, right? In that case, like stepping back as a consumer and a fan of this product, what would I want to see, right? And that helps to, to sort of inform decisions as well. You know, we'll have to get into these complaints <laughs> that you've been talking about. I'm kind of curious what people are talking about but you know just in my experience i've talked to a lot of people over the years about just emulation what's the best way to experience a, a classic game and i always think there's there's some people that claim or that feel i guess that you really need to have the original system the original hardware warts and all loading times you know the <laughs> the whole thing and you know an example of that that came up was in dungeon master they did some clever stuff with the loading mm. to fool you with the when the monsters were but anyway uh uh, but then there are people that consider that very elitist, 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not to mention you're you're blocking people that would be really into this title if it just had a few quality of life improvements. So yeah, I don't I don't know exactly where I fit in. I kind of always thought, well, the more people the better <laughs> is kind of my mantra. I don't want to be isolated to a small, you know, group yeah. of people that still have <laughs> vintage hardware at their disposal. That can be really expensive if nothing else. Well, I kind of equate to this whole thing that like, you know, if the internet wasn't around and the only way uh, that you could see the Mona Lisa or something was to travel to the place where it is and see it in person, right? And while a certain number of people could do that, you know, is it is it better for the world or worse for the world kind of thing, right? I always feel that people should be able to uh, experience things you know, as in the easiest way possible and as broadly as possible. And I think it can only benefit the industry uh, the more accessible things are. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing to be gained, I think, from uh, gating access to stuff. Um, and, um, you know, it, it only increases people's love and appreciation for the industry, I think, uh, the more you share about it. And I think that's our goal as well, is to to sort of specifically focus in a lot of ways in the foundations of this industry and properties that made monumental impacts to this industry and, and infected uh, and impacted um, all aspects of where we are now and, and sort of why we have the games we have now and things like that. And um, so I don't know, I'm always in the camp. Well, I'm a big retro game collector as well. And I have all the old systems and there's a variety, there's like, quite a few twin Famicoms here and PlayStation and, and a lot of systems here um, and at my house as well. I, while I do love the aspect of playing games on original hardware um, and there's something nostalgic about that and special about that, um, I've never felt that access should be blocked to those experiences because some of those games are, you know, magical and, and are very fun and enjoyable and can teach people a lot. And, um, being able to preserve and protect them and allow access to them in easy ways, I think is a, is a noble goal that everyone should try to achieve in my uh, humble opinion. <laughs> and <laughs> I, like, I, I totally agree with Steven, but I'm an engineer. So you're going to get the engineer's response here, which is like, yeah, like absolutely play the game. However you can play it. Games should be accessible. They should reach the broadest audience possible, but no emulation is perfect emulation. So if that's something that's very, very important to you, uh, it, it is to me, it doesn't have to be for everybody, you know, playing on the original hardware is, is going to give you that exact experience. And, and I'll give you an example. Um, so I worked on the Mega Man Legacy Collection, and there are some instructions that it runs due to a bug that are invalid. So emulation is really really good at reproducing valid instructions we, we really well understand what a piece of hardware is going to do as long as you use it correctly if you use it incorrectly what an emulator does is not necessarily going to be the same as what the hardware does and even the hardware from model to model might not do the same thing so there are these subtle differences that that uh sort of prevent you from having the the perfect recreation of the experience but again it's you know that's the technical response and it's i don't think it's important to your experience but be aware that they exist <laughs> i find that really interesting you know i was thinking about that too with atari 50 when you get to the part where there's all these different atari systems you know some i hadn't even i barely even heard of and i'm like well this is a, <laughs> a very limited run i was i was always kind of wondering well you were playing the game on that you know would it be a different how would it be different? Would you put a notice it? Now, but just to bring it back to wizardry, so I'm, I'm kind of curious. Uh, so what, you know, we could, uh, with the one that you made here, you know, we can take make it old school. You know, there's a lot of options to make it feel really old school, right? And mm -hmm. All that. But So what would be the biggest difference uh, if I said, no, 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 I want straight, I want the Apple II, I want the, you know, all the original hardware. You know, what would be the biggest differences in my experience? Uh, with our version and the original Apple II yeah. version, if you turn everything I, off? <laughs> assuming I take all the old school options, you know. Uh, well, I'm a little yeah, loath to admit it miss. because <laughs> when we're talking about the complaints we get, a lot of them are about the stuff I'm about to talk about. But um, 
we did make some a very few design or feature changes that uh we didn't tie to old school options and they're all extremely minor and mostly related like bug fixes and stuff um a, an example of that would be like hey in the original game if you divided the gold amongst your party for completing an encounter uh it used integer math to do that division and it, it had a remainder and the remainder was just tossed out. So it, we actually distribute that remaining gold in our game and we don't let you turn that off. So you, you're you going to wind up with, I don't know, three more coins per encounter, but some people have called us out on that and be like, this is not right. So I, I get it. Um, things like the, I think the biggest thing people complain about, which is very interesting uh, from a d design philosophy standpoint is in the original Apple II version, uh, there's two things people use to try to sort of avoid the consequences of, of the difficulty of the game. And one is they knew to eject their disc uh, before a save happened after some kind of bad experience. And we have save slots and we let you duplicate your save slots, but we don't really provide you an opportunity to be like, oh, like, you know, critical ejection, that that, that thing didn't happen. We that Whatever happens to your party persists. And people are used to, having that tool at their disposal so that we get a lot of guff for that. And the other is um, there's a bug you could do with identification uh, with the bishop in the original game that was just an out of bounds check, but it lets you write arbitrary memory and people would do it in a certain way to like jack up their stats and stuff like that. And, and because it's a bug, like we can't do that on modern hardware, you do that on a, you know, a PlayStation or on PC, it's just going to crash or it's going to cause some other kind of problem. So we have to plug up that bug, but people are like, well, I can't, you know, step into the dungeon and on the first tile achieve max stats using this exploit. And yeah, I'm sorry, we can't reproduce that exactly for you. Yeah, I remember, I don't remember if it was Woodhead or Serotech. They, one of them was really, even after all those years, bitter about some product that came out called, I think it's Wiz Plus. Oh yeah, we're going across that. Uh, I some of the people I I haven't used it, but some people have my... used it at the company. So, um, yeah, I mean, like in that era, there's not wasn't really any concept of like protecting your data or anything. Like the data is very plainly readable and understandable, so you can also modify it. Um, I was shocked. I added just a very little bit of encryption to our save files, and I was shocked that people haven't cracked them yet. Usually when we release a game, people crack the save format in 24 hours. Um, they are running tools. There's there's Windows tools. I don't know how much I should talk about this. There's Windows tools that you can run on PC that will let you change the data while the game is running in memory. So people are using that to sort of get ahead. But yeah, there, there will always be exploits. And, you know, we don't, you know, we do the bare minimum to try to discourage that because we're really not actually trying to discourage that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe that's really fun for people to do something like that. I, <laughs> I wouldn't do it. And for some reason, I, I keep, I don't know if I have all the details right, but I think it's Julius Caesar, Shakespeare. And there's, there's some part of the play where there's a, a clock. And so the people argue, well, there weren't clocks didn't exist back then. So that really should have been, you know, an hourglass or, you know, something else. It was just an anachronism because you know, Shakespeare didn't know the, the history that well. You know, I was just wondering if, like, if you came across something like that, and just philosophically, do you think that was, should be updated and, like, get rid of it since it's an anachronism? Or is it like, no, 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 this is the work of Shakespeare. We we leave it in. Oh, definitely the latter. Like, we, we would not ever, under any circumstance, presume <laughs> to say, like, Oh, I I don't agree with this design decision. We're right. we're gonna change it. You know, we, we, like if it's like, oh, this design decision like breaks, like the user actually can't experience the game, the player can't experience the game because of something. We might tweak it, but we're never gonna like say like like Wizardry does have a lot of acronyms. It's a weird fantasy game, but it's got like elevators and stuff in it. So you know, <laughs> yeah, it's true. We we try to avoid changing stuff as much as possible. Obviously, sometimes we work with publishers on certain IPs that they want to adjust stuff because we're, you know, if 
for sensitivities or any other reason. Okay, right? that's, like, that's a good answer, actually. Uh, and things like that. And so there, there might be times that we have to, or legal reasons, right? Because people were a little bit more wishy-washy back then about legal stuff. Um, but uh, normally, um, as much as possible, we try to avoid modifying or changing the original mm -hmm. stuff uh, when we can and only do it begrudgingly when it's sort of strongly asked of us, really. Yeah, I was just thinking again of the Dash Times video. There's a lot of uh, references and allusions in that game, the stuff that people knew back in the when it came out. I think it was the 80s. <laughs> so like on a modern audience, you're like, even me, I'm like, I didn't even remember that, you know, this reference to this little thing that was happening. So, you know, Becky might say, well, I would change it to this, you know, listen to her. <laughs> but it's, I would hate to be the, in this, the, making those decisions myself, you know, with how to update that. But uh, But anyway... Well, that's why in Wizardry we added our old school options menu because then we didn't have to make those decisions. We can yeah. let you make the decisions. <laughs> well, that's the wonderful thing of this, right? You can always make it an option. Uh, I wanted to get a little bit into this idea of, of future proofing because that is one of the missions, right? Is not just next year, but 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we'll be, I guess, we'll be on 16K. <laughs> <laughs> Yeesh. Oh, I hope not. <laughs> sure, as is in the future we know it won't be identical to what, what we have now but we still want people to be able to access these games and play them and have the experience so, so what are the strategies uh, that you've developed for future proofing so i mean in a lot of ways there's a sort of variety of situations i mean i think fundamentally our sort of engine or engine layer that we use uh for these projects um, is is pretty streamlined and designed to have sort of a broad support for platforms and, and also uh, knock on wood in most cases um, allow for relatively easy integration of new emulators and, and things like that. Um, and so the goal is to try to be able to, to, to build a system that as we move forward, you know, with future consoles and stuff like that, the amount of work uh, to sort of get things up and running on those future platforms, as long as there aren't drastic changes by the platform manufacturers, um, is hopefully relatively straightforward. And and I always kind of give the example of of movies where every time there is a new format, you know, we went from DVD to Blu-ray to 4K things like that. There's always this race for re-release, right? You're going to see Casablanca and, and, and anything like that on every single format or Godfather and things like that, right? It, it, there's, never, there's not going to be a single generation that goes by where you're not going to see those sort of movies, right? However, the games industry, um, you know, games come and go and disappear and things like that. And you don't see um, often that sort of re-releasing of stuff on future systems. It's sort of one and done for the most cases, right? Unless there is some sort of plan to do like some quote unquote HD remaster or things like that. But for most games, um, they're kind of left by the wayside and, and gone, right? So, um, you know, what we try to sort of do is make sure whenever possible to, to release physical versions of as many of our products as possible. And ideally um, release them that, um, so that all the patches and any content you need fundamentally are on the disc and the cartridge. And I say this, we try to do this. Sometimes it's a, it's non-avoidable or you can't avoid it. But when we can, we try to do that as much. So like 10 years from now, if you got the console or whatever, you pull the disc off the shelf. Um, it doesn't matter that the online store isn't there anymore, right? Or things like that. You can still play those products. And the on the other side of that is uh, continuously to work on our own engine systems and emulators and things like that so that when future platforms get released that we can quickly move on to those new platforms and if there is a request from a, a publisher or our own internal teams of wanting to re-release stuff on new platforms it doesn't become this big chore right it's it's hopefully pretty straightforward um, and doesn't take a lot of time and it's never going to be perfect because we can't control uh, console manufacturing and and what sort of features and what sort of hardware goes into that, but we can try our best to make our systems you know flexible and simple enough where, um, regardless, hopefully we can 
bringing things over quickly, right? I don't know if Ian, you have anything to add to that. But... Yeah, no, like you kind of hit all of the major talking points I would hit. I don't have a lot to add. I I would say um, we do live in a, a kind of a golden era for this, but where like Microsoft and Sony on their consoles are doing their own initiatives to sort of keep things backwards compatible. But if you're familiar with, you know, the history of games and console manufacturers, that's, that's a roll of the dice. You don't know if that's important to anyone from one generation to the next. So, so right now it's kind of a golden era, but we can't rely on that. So yeah, you know, we're, we're doing what we can to try to make that, that transition easy. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes they don't want it to be backwards compatible. Exactly. <laughs> people into the new system. Yeah. I was thinking too, of the Atari 50, some of the games, it would say, well, this was originally designed for a trackball, mm -hmm. special controls, you know, that obviously kind of difficult to play. <laughs> you know, if you don't have, have that, it is kind of an off the cuff idea. Have you, have you been following this Apple Vision Pro? Uh, yeah, we have we have some folks who are big VR heads uh, here. <laughs> that, who, that who simulated funny. trackball experience somehow. Uh, I I don't know. I mean, I don't want to speak for it because I haven't experienced it, but I don't think that the hand recognition is to a level that you could do that very well yet. Um, um, uh, I'm is... not on the cutting edge of it, but my experience <laughs> is that tracking is a little <laughs> laggy and it's it, it's not ideal for very precise movement anyway. <laughs> And that's something that's a good point to bring up. Like we spend a lot of time, like to your to your point, Matt, like a lot of these games use trackballs and different controllers and stuff like that. And and one of the things that we spend so much time on is figuring out ways to replicate that stuff on the different controllers for different platforms, right? It takes a lot of time. Like most people don't think about it. They're just like, oh, uh, you know, they just it's kind of like one of those behind the scenes things. But we spend a ton of time trying to figure out the best way to convey you know, that sort of input to the player, whether it's like the touch screen in some cases for the switch or providing like a ton of levels of sensitivity controls and things like that for other controllers uh, like PlayStation or Xbox controllers and things like that. Um, it's always a challenge because you're trying to take one sort of input that's drastically different and trying to sort of get it to fit, you know, the round peg into the square hole as far as a completely different type of controller, right? And uh, it's always a challenge. It's always a challenge. We do the best that we can do by providing options to the player to adjust it to their liking, but it's always going to be um, something that will have to be overcome. And it's not an easy thing, which is why you don't see a lot of people spending a lot of time with it because it does take a lot of time to do right. Um, and uh, you know, we pride ourselves on that sort of you know, um, time and care into our products, um, but it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. Steven, can you talk a little bit about the 3D printed controller mods? Oh, right. Yeah. So um, <laughs> even <laughs> exactly. We, we, it was a big hit, actually. When we did um, Atari 50, Mike went in and did some sort of research and started printing out these, um, these sort of spinners that you would snap onto the front of your Xbox controller or PlayStation controller um, that could replicate and kind of help you play some of these games uh, in Atari 50. And we actually shared, I think, the 3D uh, printing files for that so that people could print it themselves and snap onto the controller. But it kind of goes to show you that even beyond the game, we try to think of ways to accurately reflect the experience that you had. Um, yeah, exactly. So oh, this yeah. is, this, yeah, perfect, yeah. So this is a prototype version of it, but we shared these STL files and you could just print them out and put it on there and uh, control the game, certain games that way. And we actually adjusted certain games for it. So uh, again, it just goes to show you, we, we kind of go the extra mile. We, we obviously want people to enjoy what the original intention of the game was as best as possible, given modern controllers. And so we're always kind of pursuing stuff like this. Oh my God, that's awesome. <laughs> oh, I got to get a, a 3D printer. <laughs> There's certain places that you can actually just send off and get it printed and mailed to you too. And I think a lot of people did that for this. That is awesome. Yeah, I know that for, you know, I was thinking too, like the paddles. I don't even know how many people even know what we're talking about when you're like, <laughs> <laughs> at a paddle. But I, I was going to say, to compliment you again, you know, I played Breakout and a couple of the, uh, of course, you had to play Pong. <laughs> you know, right. I played a lot of different versions of that. And I think that it, yours was, I just played it with the mouse. 
Uh, but it was easier to control, I thought, uh, than a lot of the versions I've played. Because I'm really good at breakout. <laughs> but also some of the emulated versions I've played, it's just doesn't match. You know, you have to have that good control. Yeah, and sometimes it's like this balance of like accuracy versus how things feel. Like we we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how, does something feel good, right? And it's also a challenge because all of the controllers have different amounts of dead you know, dead space in the center and the width of them and things like that. So it's it's just because you have it feeling right in one controller doesn't mean that it feels right in another controller. Um, and so again, I harken back, like we spend so much time, like even that, like what does the paddle feel like in in breakout, right? Like how what's the, the sort of speed that it goes and how it accelerates and things like that. Um, there's a lot of care and attention put into that. Yeah, and just... like hearkening back to our discussion about the the experience we have at the company, we, we do have people who can pick up our game and and just say like, no, this doesn't feel right. We need to tweak it in this way. So that's another advantage we have in that yeah. space. And we have access to a lot of old hardware too. Like if you ever come visit us, we have a lot of, you know, er, between a lot of us <laughs> at the company are, are retro game collectors and things like that, and especially Mike. And so it's nice to be able to just kind of go and say, what did this feel like on the original hardware inherently? And then run back and then test it, right? So we have that, we compare and contrast a lot with original hardware. Yeah, a lot of those, a lot of those games I was playing, I'd forgotten completely, talk about nostalgia kicking in, right? <laughs> I mean, I right. completely forgot how freaking hard it is to shoot diagonally. <laughs> Yeah. Pretty joystick, you know, the little Atari things and yes, you know, some of those games. And I'm like, oh, all I got to do now is just hold the two. Yeah, but I remember this was a you know, there's no way I could do this with a joystick. <laughs> nope, I remember. Uh, let's see how we do. We got a little, you guys okay for a couple more? Yeah, we sure. got a couple more minutes. Yeah, we got a couple more minutes. Yeah, yeah so what are we doing with the are we going to see wizardry, the, the other wizardries? Uh, <laughs> I guess up to four before they switch to the uh, that other engine, right? We're gonna. Uh, what I can say is the team would love to do that, and I'm not allowed to say more. <laughs> yeah, like all we can sort of say is, you know, support. You know, though we obviously would love to do more, like Ian said, support the products, and inevitably, right? Hopefully, we'll see more and things like that. So it's all about. Um, ironically you know speaking with your with your dollars right like if there's the if there's enough interest with this wizardry release um and people love it and the people enjoy it and they want to see more then of course we we would want to come together as a studio and, and create more but certainly nothing to announce right now unfortunately i wonder if it would almost be like dlc these days because if i recall you, you have to correct me if i can mix this up like in the original series you'd have to you'd carry your characters from one game into the next right and they is that how it works so you just carry the party all the way through you couldn't just start with wizardry 2 that was the case yes um probably wouldn't want to would you stay true to that or <laughs> uh the team has had some discussions about if we did it how we would do it and it's hard to really answer those questions you know unless we're sure we're going forward with that kind of thing but uh yeah there's there's a couple of ways that is actually you know just by virtue of the way modern hardware works, that is a very difficult thing for us to do, but that doesn't mean it's an impossible thing for us to do. Uh, we know that it's very important to the users to have that experience. So. Hmm. Yeah, I'm pretty sure when I finish Wizardry, I'm going to be bugging you. <laughs> <laughs> what about part two? Uh, yeah, we talked a little bit about this before we, we started uh, the show, but we were talking about some of the wizardries that were they're still, I guess, exclusively uh, Japanese. I think some of them translated. Do you have any interest in bringing any of those? We uh, talked about that a lot, you know, as far as uh, as what we would want to include in a wizardry product and things like that. Because there are um, there are like you know, there's the handheld versions. There's a wonder there's a wonder swan version, um, and a lot of them have. Uh, almost full English translations that can be unlocked different ways and, and, and stuff like that. Um, but it's tough because you kind of have to have a primer, like you have to have, you know, you've kind of got to release the original wizardry and 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 see if there's interest there and and get people into it and understanding wizardry again, right? A whole a, a new generation before you kind of go down the route of these other versions, right? 
Um, but yeah, we definitely discussed it. Um, uh, several of those versions are, are, are great fun and, and classics in their, their own right. And uh, if, if for me, I'd love to eventually, and I'm sure probably Ian would too, like in the future, if, if this wizard becomes the success that we hope it is, and we're able to do more, um, giving giving a, a little bit more of a digital eclipse treatment and, and being able to include some of these other versions of the game. So people have a compare and contrast like, Oh, this was on the handheld. This is what it was like. And, and, and things mm -hmm. like that. Right. Um, would be, would be nice, but, um, but no plans for that uh, right now, unfortunately. Um, and the, the secret there is like, if you're excited about it, you know, we're excited about it too. Like we're, we're fans of these oh, games. Yeah, no so doubt. we, yeah. we want to make all this stuff happen. It's just a matter of how, uh, the leg up we have is, you know, pretty uniquely for this product, the release of Wizardry, the modern release of Wizardry Proving Grounds and Mad Overlord, we brought together the Surtex and Dracom and, and all of the license holders. So all of the people who need to be involved in that conversation are, we're interacting with them on the regular. So that makes it a lot more possible than it would have been just a few years ago. <laughs> I think that was a major accomplishment just in its own right. Just getting everyone at the table and, and going through the, uh, uh, you know, like the legal ownerships of stuff and, and figuring out who owns what and getting everyone to kind of talk together was, um, was a monumental kind of accomplishment I feel too. So. Yeah, no yeah. kidding. I remember talking to Winston, Winston Douglas Wood, a fantasy. And I was asking, you know, you know, why don't you bring the fantasy games back? He's like, I wouldn't even know where to start. <laughs> it wasn't it, not, the technical stuff was solvable, but it's just like, who's got the rights and how do you get the licenses? And oh yeah, we struggled. That's another thing. Like when I say that, mention the controls, like the legal ownership rights is something that we in the background spend so much time doing, right? Because when you have games 20, 30, 40 years old, it's lost to the ages, right? Who owns what? Oh, a company owned it that's no longer in existence. Did they pass it along to someone else? We've had many situations where um, people who thought they owned stuff didn't and vice versa. Like yeah, people who, very... did, who didn't think that they owned it actually ended up owning it uh, because we did the research. Yeah, it happens all the time because, um, you know, there's new people, the companies, there's no connection to the past. No one's willing to do the research and things like that. And so that's part of what we have to do as uh, the historians on our side and the preservationists. We have to spend all of that, you know, um, hard time researching and, and figuring out who owns this stuff. And some of it is a scenario where like two different parties believe they own something mm -hmm. and we can communicate them. It's like, well, can either of you demonstrate that? And the answer <laughs> will be no, neither of them can. So it's like, okay, so who's going to stick their neck out to try right. to solve this, right? Because yeah. we're not, we, we can't necessarily take on that legal risk. So we have to get the people talking to each other and, and sort things out. <laughs> yeah, it's such a mess. You know, so I tend to get on that soapbox a lot. They, they really need to have a better system for tracking like who owns what and who has the uh, the rights to these products. You know, th and there's a lot of movies that one of my favorites, Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> and apparently there was a point where they were supposed to reapply, I guess, for copyright, didn't do it. So now it's in the public domain. If you're oh, yeah. Yeah. The battle for the uh, public domain. I almost, wish, I, wish, I almost wish, I don't know if I wish this or not. I, I kind of wish sometimes uh, there was something like that for games. You know, so if nobody cares about this and it's just been languishing for tw you know, 20 years, it's over. You know, people can take it and do what they will. <laughs> you know, I yeah, think I mean, it's tough. Minimum, there should be like a government site somewhere where like, if you still care about this thing, you won't <laughs> go to yeah. the government website, fill out the form, you know, and you're good. Yeah. I, I, and some of the, some of what we're running to, like, you know, we mentioned how it was great working with Jordan Mechner because he, he really just kept a whole lot of materials from that time frame, uh, And it's just a byproduct of the period of the games we're working with a lot is people people didn't have the foresight to say oh this is going to be important in five years in 10 years let alone you know 40 years later <laughs> have you ever thought of well yeah there's a question here about your, your dream project i know you probably have a, a lot of them but i was, I was sure thinking a lot about uh the ultima series and richard garriott i don't know mm. if you ever talked to him because he's another one of these guys that he's collect he has archived everything that sounds great to me. Every <laughs> if you told me I had to do remasters or collections of 
you know, RPGs from the eighties for the rest of my life, I would, I would die a happy man. <laughs> you have to do CRPG titles for the <laughs> remasters. <Yeah. laughs> I'm, I'm on board. Let's do it. <laughs> Reach out to us. Call yeah. me Richard. <laughs> You and know, it's getting, I mean, to the point, it's getting a little bit easier. Like, you know, I think the Gold Master series really was a wake-up call for the industry um, and made people more aware of sort of our serious goals to sort of preserve stuff and tell stories and things like that. So we are starting to see more and more people reach out to us or have suggestions for stuff and things like that. So uh, who knows? I mean, we envision the Gold Master series going for a long period of time. You know, I'd love... I'd love to 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 get into the double digits before I retire, right? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I joked so. that uh, we we made a mistake starting it with just one zero. <laughs> right, right, right. We should have started at number one hundred. Yeah. Um, yeah, but so uh, for Goldmaster zero zero one, wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, I'd love to sort of see that continue on, and you know, it's 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 nice and heartwarming to see people reach out and see what we're trying to accomplish. Cause when we were doing Atari 50, um, which was kind of the precursor to the gold master series, it was really hard to articulate to people what that was without being able to show them it. right. They're like, they sort of get it, but they don't really, but now that people see it in physical form and they can interact with it and they see what we're trying to do, they get it now. And so I think, that has really helped open the doors to a lot of other companies, a lot of other IPs uh, of folks who are reaching out to us saying like, hey, yeah, we'd love to see the treatment done to this or this, right? So I think it's only a good thing. I know for a fact he's interested because a few years ago he contacted me and he's like, I need an archivist, <laughs> you know, tons and tons of stuff. I want to figure out some means. It kind of petered out, no, but I know he's got that interest. Yeah. Well, tell him to reach out to us. Yeah, you know. plug in his ear somehow to contact. Yeah, yeah, freaking awesome. You've, you've got our email addresses. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, we talked about a lot of stuff here. I know. Is there other things you probably wanted to say a little more about the uh, your Mighty Morphin? Oh, no? I mean, no, I mean, it's it's uh, you know, I think that uh, we appreciate obviously everyone's continued support for what we do, and um, you know, we're excited about original products like Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, because again, it, it harkens back to like a property that a lot of us grew up with. Oh, yeah. And it's a perfect match for the classic type of gameplay that was popular during the 90s that you'd find in an arcade, right? Um, so it really hits all the spots for us. And so we're really excited to to get that out later this, later this year. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I think you'll, you'll see more from us obviously in the future as we have more to announce we have a very busy year this year and and it's looking like next year is starting to get a, a little bit busy oh no don't say <laughs> that steven as well <laughs> uh but um certainly like you know if if you want to learn more about us come to our digital clips website we have a newsletter that you can sign up to uh as well and we promise not to mail out too many newsletters we actually rarely send them out and it's normally pretty good info um, so you can sign up there. You can follow us on all the socials. We're on pretty much all the websites so that you can keep track and tabs on what we're doing and what's coming up next. But um, yeah, a lot of stuff to announce uh, still that we're working on uh, for this year. And, um, you know, thanks to everyone for coming along on the journey with with us. Yeah, some sometimes we send out game codes on that list. So if you're just That's interested true. for that even reason, please sign up. I, I will say I'm going to speak uh, of... Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Um, little insider info. So the team is is really excited about how that was received. All the all the very positive feedback. Also, absolutely terrified and stressed out because now they <laughs> they feel like they need to live up to this big hype. Um, and and it's just going to make the project the product that much better for it. Like everybody's everybody's really sort of locked in right now, trying to trying to make that the best product we can make it. That sounds awesome. I need to sh shoot an email to my brother. He's a, he was an even bigger fan of that. I have I have these memories of him and they, my younger I got a bunch of brothers, but they when Christmas they got the Power Rangers uh, costumes. Oh, <laughs> right. And man, they were just running around. It was insane. Punching and kicking everything. <laughs> oh yeah. It's a good thing they were really small. It didn't really hurt too bad. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks guys. This has been awesome. Yeah, All no, right. our pleasure. Thanks for having us on. And, uh, 
you know, you like I said, Lord's work. Thank you. We appreciate it. And, uh, you know, thanks, for, like I said, thanks for the interest for having us on. And uh, we're always happy to spread the word about what we're trying to accomplish and sort of our goals and, and get the message out there. So thanks for helping to spread the message. Okay. And if you want more of what we do, just, you know, buy, buy the games, yep. wishlist them, recommend them to your friends. We want to keep doing this forever, but we need your help to do it. So, Well, I know a lot of my audience will be they probably already bought wizardry yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing they're usually telling me about it like oh you gotta go. and there's nothing wrong with buying it on multiple platforms <laughs> <laughs> yeah how many platforms is it available for all, all of them it's all of the consoles and steam and gog okay yeah go ahead and buy all the <laughs> <laughs> buy them all is there some merch with it you should have some merch yeah, we've been talking about that a bit uh, too in the future and stuff like that. And what I we I think we would love to try to get more into the merch game and things. We we started treading into it with sort of digital clips branded stuff, um, but now that we're sort of part of Atari, I think we're going to try to do a little bit more on stuff. So who knows? Maybe in the future, some point, you may see some wizardry merchandise. But who knows? I need something to sell on GameStops. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I saw you had a digital Eclipse T-shirt somewhere. Yeah, we've we've had them for a while, but Atari now sells one as well on their website. So, yep. You know, right. you know, you made it when you got a T-shirt with your <laughs> with your logo on it. Well, I I need to, I need it. You know, I I love collecting T-shirts. We'll send us your size. We'll probably send you one. <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> they get on that. All right, guys. Thanks again. All right. Yeah, thank no you. No worries. Thank you. And that's all for this episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, should be back very soon. Got some great interviews, uh, more interviews uh, uh, lined up. Uh, got some more gameplay videos we're going to be doing. Lots and lots of great stuff. But it will only happen if you are willing to help. Uh, so please, we're kind of, you know, I'm not, I don't want to beg you, but we really do need your help. I mean, this would be uh, a very good time for you to step up if you've been waiting. If you're holding out <laughs> on supporting the show, please uh, don't do that anymore. Go to the link of the show notes. Uh, the Patreon site, it's fast, it's easy. You know, it'll, it'll basically accommodate whatever. You know, if you want to do a one-time, just a one-time donation, you can do that. If you want to set up a subscription, you can do that too. Uh, but really do need your help, Matt. Uh, Bradley Shergi and I, so please do that if you haven't done so already. And of course, if you have done so already, I thank you very, 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 very much. As long as my, my hair, that's as long as my gratitude is. <laughs> uh, thank you for keeping this show in the air. We couldn't do it without you. So, thanks. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? <laughs> All right, Punny writes in. Punny's really excited. Lots of old school classics coming to modern systems thanks to LRG or limited run games. They do wonderful stuff. Uh, they got the Fighting Force Collection, the Gex Trilogy, Fear Effect. Uh, let's see. Yeah, they're based in Raleigh, North Carolina. That's a beautiful place. You know, I wouldn't mind taking a little tour of their facility. Uh, let's see what else they got in the pipe here. 20 new titles that will receive physical releases as part of the LRG 2024 showcase, including Beyond the Good and Evil 20th Anniversary Edition, Lollipop, Chainsaw, Repop, Penny's Big Break Away, and more. Uh, so exciting stuff for fans of those series, I'm sure. Uh, next up, Lobsterminator writes in about Roguecraft. Uh, Roguecraft is coming to the Amiga, which I have sitting over there out of camera sight <laughs> very soon. Uh, very exciting stuff. The official Amiga version of Roguecraft by Badger Punch <laughs> Games. <laughs> Badger Punch. That's a good name for a studio, isn't it? Let's see. For time immemorial, a legend has been told of a dark, deadly dungeon containing unimaginable horrors and riches beyond belief. Enough riches and magic to make you a king or more. Roguecraft, modern turn-based roguelike, focused on simplicity and fun. So I was trying to figure out why they call it Roguecraft, and I thought it might have something to do with Minecraft, but I think I'm off on the wrong foot, <laughs> the wrong, uh, uh, wrong path with that. It's a, an enhanced version of something called Rogue 64, 
which was a roguelike for the Commodore 64. So I'm not quite sure where the craft <laughs> part of the uh, title comes in, but you know, if you know more about that story, please chime in. I'm trying to learn more about this, this studio. You know, if you name your studio Badger Punch, you know, somebody like me will want to know more. <laughs> so how do I punch those badgers? <laughs> you know, I should come up with one. Rat Punch Studio. Uh, Rat Smash Studio. You know, that's not a bad name. <sighs> All right. Anyway, uh, Miko writes in about a game called Cyclopean. Cyclopean? Cyclopean? You know, I see every time you read H.P. Lovecraft, you see that word. Cyclopean. <laughs> it's like the Cyclops. And I guess the idea is big architecture because these guys are massive, big muscles, you know, they're putting these pillars up and columns and stuff. As you kind of imagine the city where everything is huge, which makes you feel really small. Uh, anyway, uh, well, it's appropriate they use that word because this is a Lovecraftian dungeon crawler from the creators of the Islands of the Caliph. Trapped in the vaults of Zinn, you are Randolph Carter, old dreamer and friend of cats. Okay. Uh, the spiteful and mischievous, I always want to say mischievous, but I think it's mischievous, but I just kind of like mischievous better. You know, it's kind of mischievous to squeeze that little E in there, I think, so it's fitting. Uh, anyway, the spiteful and mischievous, of which Sherman, uh, anyway, we zoogs, after making an unholy alliance with the gas, have improvised you and several cats in the haunted Cyclopean vaults of Zinn. You must find the exit of the vaults and rescue as many cats as you can or die trying. Now, I like the monochrome aesthetic on this, and I'm wondering if any of you guys remember back in the day, really early days of DOS, <laughs> or maybe not that early, but, but anyway, uh, even more primitive in some ways in CGA, there was this thing called Hercules. <laughs> I remember my friend had one, and it was, uh, I guess it got a really good resolution for the time, but it was monochrome. So it wasn't that much fun for gaming, but apparently for productivity, it was really a great thing. And, you know, I hear that people still, there's still people out there that prefer that uh, Hercules thing uh, to all the modern stuff. They somehow find it more, uh, I guess it's more stimulating for their productivity. <laughs> anyway, uh, I just thought I would throw that out there, see so if anybody uh, knows more about that or has stories to share. All right, what about that ale of the week? Well, ale, 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 what do we have over here? We've got a, another one of these fabulous uh, non-alcoholic beers from Untitled Art. Now, I'm, I'm a huge fan of their, uh, what they call their S'mores Dark, I think they call it. Uh, this one's a juicy IPA. Uh, I don't think they, they don't really put a lot of information on their bottles. Apparently it's got a, or cans, I guess. It's got a gram of protein, 55 calories. Uh, there you go. Uh, so let's see, out of Wanakee, Wisconsin. Artwork by Stephanie Hammond. This is a kind of chic can. I don't know how well you'll be able to see this. It's kind of got this uh, paint daub-like effect going around. You know, really for these, if the can's going to look this nice, you kind of want to drink straight from the can, but we'll pour it into the glass and the horn just so you can see what's going on with this. All right, juicy IPA. So an IPA, you want that to be ordinarily fairly bitter, fairly hoppy. You know, you really want that hot punch. Uh, with a good IPA. And the juicy, I guess a little bit of sweetness, maybe a little bit of citrus uh, to kind of weigh in there, balance it out a little bit. Really fantastic action on that. Just hundreds and I guess probably thousands and thousands of bubbles on this. Almost a Pilsner-like color on it. A uh, very light color, a lot of head, a lot of foam. It's probably going to be very refreshing. You definitely smell the hops in here, very lemony, piney. Uh, very good smell. You know, it smells just exactly what you'd expect uh, an IPA to smell like. Uh, I'm not sure what kind of juice is in this, do they say? I wonder if it's grapefruit or lemon or orange. <laughs> I, guess we'll, I guess we'll see. I'll give it a little taste. Well, let me, yeah, I'll taste it out of this, then we'll pour it in the horn. Uh, again, uh, a great flavor on this one. Uh, this one, uh, you know, I'm not going to say I like this as much as I like the s'mores one. Um, it's, it's, you, you could sort of tell this is a non-alcoholic. You know, it's just a little bit lighter uh, tasting than you would get from, a, you know, an alcohol uh, juicy IPA. Uh, but it's not bad. You can just sort of barely tell. You know, most people probably wouldn't be able to tell at all. 
You know, there's always heard that there's been these cases where people have showed up to frat parties and stuff with non-alcoholic brew and didn't tell anybody, and that the people that were doing all the drinking uh, were acting just as drunk, uh, even though it was non-alcohol. <laughs> you know, I don't know what's up with that, or if that's a true story or not, but, you know, it sounds pretty fascinating. I'd love to experiment sometime. Uh, okay, let me try it out of the horn here. And it's a pretty good flavor on this. You know, again, it's a very light body. Um, nice action. It's not terrible. <laughs> it's not bad. Uh, it's just, I think you would be better off with your uh, s'mores dark. Uh, but again, this is okay. If you need a non-alcoholic beer, you really like the uh, the IPAs, I would probably go a little bit more bitter on that if I were them a little more hoppy. Because uh, if you're not going to have alcohol, you got to have some bite coming from somewhere. Uh, so I try to kind of ratchet up the hops a little uh, bit on that, uh, maybe even amp up the uh, uh, whatever they're using for their uh, juice. <laughs> uh, maybe increase that a little bit just for more effect. But uh, anyway, as is, it's a very light, sort of refreshing beer. Uh, again, if you've been out mowing the grass, you're hot, you, you know, you, you don't want to dehydrate yourself. You want something like a beer. <laughs> That's a, a good choice for you, I guess. But uh, not quite as impressed as I was with their... Uh, uh, s'mores flavor and so i'll go maybe three out of five on this if we're just talking about non-alcohols non-alcoholics na's i might push it up to four because it is you know pretty decent uh, it doesn't hit you it's not instantly recognizable as a non-alcoholic you know just if you drink a lot of beer <laughs> you know when you swallow it you kind of you kind of wait for that uh, sort of kick that bite uh, and when you don't get it, you're like, what? <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> That's kind of the case with this. Uh, again, not bad. And if you don't want to, if you avoid alcohol or you're in a situation where you don't want to get uh, intoxicated, <laughs> uh, you know, the, you, the, you can live without the, uh, the bite. So uh, anyway, now let's wrap it up with a quotation. And I was looking for quotes about history, and I found one from uh, Alexis, de, Alexis de Tocqueville. Alexi? Alexis, you know, I read his Democracy in America book in college. Huge book. Really famous. Well, people say it's even better now than it was back when he wrote it, which I think was like in the 1700s when he wrote that. A really early look at, uh, well, Democracy in America. But anyway, the quote goes something like this. History is a gallery of pictures in which there are few originals and many copies. So ponder on that, and I'll see you guys next time. I want to get online. I need a computer.